Every founder's story is different. And today we're going to be focused on the entrepreneurial journey. We're going to talk about value creation. We're probably going to go a little bit into how diversity and inclusion is changing the corporate landscape and the small business landscape. And then we're going to talk about building an exit strategy and maximizing product, revenue, and operations offers. So stay tuned. Give us a listen. We're going to have Jim Barnish on here, and we're going to go into a lot of detail on all of those things. Thanks for listening. As always, I'm your host, Tim Kubiak. You can find us at Bowties in Business on Facebook and Instagram and Bowties in B-I-Z on Twitter. You can find me at Tim Kubiak just about everywhere. Jim, thanks for being here. Can you introduce yourself a little bit more? Yeah, thanks, Tim. Uh, great intro and love the name of the podcast. Sorry I didn't bring my bow tie today. <laughs> it, it's summer. I didn't wear one either. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my story starts within my family business at the, the ripe young age of 15. Um, and really, from then until the day, spent the last few decades um, as an entrepreneur, operator, venture capitalist, and M&A consultant. Um, throughout those years, uh, a lot of hard work, a lot of failure, uh, mostly failure, <laughs> sleepless nights, failed projects, acquisitions, family squabbles. <laughs> uh, no matter the role I had in, you know, in or on the business, whether it was the family business or afterwards, all of the growth stage tech companies that I worked alongside um, really had all of the same growth and value creation obstacles, especially if they were looking to exit. Uh, strategy and talent misalignment, lack of product market fit, pricing, cost, user-unfriendly product, you name it. Um, and that got exacerbated when I got into the world of venture capital when I saw the companies that were getting funded and having capital poured on top of what they had already built from a growth perspective, um, the mistakes that were being made in many cases to try to uh, you know, drive, drive growth through purely, you know, the addition of capital rather than not always just, you know, strategy and, and smart growth. Um, and eventually, you know, navigating my way through about 30 acquisitions, uh, five exits as an investor or operator and a bunch of shareholder value. Um, I thought there had to be a better way to help these technology businesses that venture capital might not be serving all that well and ultimately make them worth so much more. And that's what I do today. So I'm going to dive in on a couple of things there because literally yeah. I was talking to a friend who's looking at a CRO role at a VC funded company, right? Uh, small early stage, um, pre-series A, so seed money round. It's raised, you know, upper seven figures though. So it's not, it's not a bad, not a bad funding source. And yeah. one of the conversations we were having as he's doing his due diligence was the whole conversation around customer acquisition for exit versus profitable customer acquisition for long-term operators. How often do you see that in the tech space? Qu quite a bit. Uh, most of the founders that, that we're working with have built an awesome business for the last five, 10, or 20 years. Um, they're not your typical you know, one year and raise capital founders. They're typically between a few million and 50 million in revenue. Um, and they're typically profitable, which is honestly where part of the name Orchid Black comes from in the black. In the black. Uh, oh, nice. And <laughs> so they're, they're not your typical VC-backed companies. They've, they've bootstrapped to a certain point. But there is, uh, you know, there is this knowledge that they could grow a lot smarter and they could grow a lot faster if they were to reinvest, um, you know, some of their proceeds, some of their profits back into the business. Yeah. And that's always, I find, a challenge with founders. When I've worked with them, when I've worked for them, you know, and frankly, as one is when do you reinvest? When do you take out? You know, and what is that right balance? Yeah, and I know it's different for everybody, but do you see a set of best practices or maybe even worst practices when you walk in the door <laughs> with somebody? Yeah, I mean, it, it really sits at the intersection between venture capital and private equity. My venture capital is known as focus on the opportunity, focus on the founders, focus on the team, and and ultimately, you know, make your bets and then throw them against the wall and hope for the best. You know, yeah. put, I'm putting it bluntly. That's not what they'll say, but that's the theory. Um, that is bet, on a, <laughs> bet on 100, get a couple unicorns. But there is a reason why venture capital is one of the worst performing asset classes if you look at it at an aggregate level. Um, it's because there are unicorns, right? Uh, and those unicorns or those billion-dollar companies make up for all the losses. 
And then on the other side, you've got your private equity firms who actually are true operators. But in, in many cases, that operation sits at the intersection between finance and bringing in the right talent, not necessarily strategy and operational. So kind of the difference between financial engineering and operational engineering, if you will. Um, and, and so um, when we look at this concept of a unicorn, super growth, high growth, you know, ultimately unicorns are kind of mythical, <laughs> right, in the concept of what they actually are. Yeah. But orchids, uh, which, uh, you know, is kind of partly also the other side of our name came from, are real, and they can grow for over 100 years when tended to properly. And when cultivated and, and pruned and experts are taking care of them, and you'll ask anyone who owns an orchid, they're actually not the easiest to take care of. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's a real big philosophy we have is you don't just grow fast like a unicorn. You grow smart and you grow fast when you do things in a more predictable manner. That's an, that is a tough conversation to have with a lot of founders. <laughs> it is. It is. Right? Be because... I see almost every day, and you probably see it multiple times a day, I want to be the next marquee name, whoever <laughs> it is. And, and telling them being the biggest might not be the best. It takes a little bit of massage around that founder's ego, I would think. It, it does. Um, you know, uh, it is our, our, um, our focus and our um, perfect fit, if you will, from a founder perspective is somebody who's been building their business for a while. They recognize that they're hitting a lot of targets, but they're, they're missing others. And um, part of their reason for engaging with us is we're able to provide a, an objective lens to that company's true potential in the market uh, from a 360 perspective, you know, product, revenue, operations, strategy across the board. And they realize that they have this exit in mind. They, they want it so bad, but they don't know how to maximize their value. And so there is this level of coachability. There is this level of, man, I've tried a lot of things <laughs> and I can't seem to crack the code. Um, and ultimately, there's a, there's a level of humility that they know they've built a great business, but they know that it could be worth so much more. Um, when we find those right, perfect fit founders, which is why, you know, we don't have 100 clients. We're pretty boutique in our program. Um, and, and we really look for the companies that, whether it's in six months or 36 months, we can help them increase the value of their business substantially and, and exit and provide a legacy for, for themselves and, and their family, which is pretty great. That's pretty great. You said you had, you've had 30 exits as an investor operator. Did I catch that number right? No, th 30, 30 acquisitions on the buy side, most of them on the buy side, five, five exits. Five exits. Okay. Still, five, five exits is pretty good. Yes. It yes. means you're, run and you're running a lot of businesses. Been a journey. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you you joked in your opening about sleepless nights and conflict, right? Yeah. So you came out of a family business. Did you learn how to manage that first by being in the family business? <laughs> I learned a lot in the family business. I mean, you have to when you get thrown into things at 15, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, most of all, you know, about family businesses, um, I... I learned that families tend to really try, family businesses tend to really keep things close to the chest, right? You hire family to run the family business, outside board members or advisory board members seem like a foreign concept. Um, and ultimately, uh, you don't have a whole lot of uh, uh, support system other than the family to lean on because of the way you operate. And so what I learned is, um, that ultimately you need outside counsel, ultimately, um, you know, bringing in people to help you manage and, and um, bring best practices into the family business of the organization is, uh, is acceptable and, and quite frankly, is the right thing to do to drive value in the business. And I learned that uh, even though we had a lot of success in the family business, we probably could have been worth a lot more had we just, you know, not felt like we needed to do it all ourselves. <laughs> Um, so I think, you know, those were a lot of my lessons learned and, you know, I wish I had folks like yourself or, or us at Orchid Black that, you know, were helping us navigate those challenges because we had a lot, like I said, we had a lot of success, but the failures would have been, um, a lot less prevalent had we brought in some outside counsel. And, you know, that's a great point because a lot of times you see companies post acquisition, right? Or even post sort of company life cycle, the tech 
in, and I've got tech background as well. The tech gets to a certain point, the founder's vision no longer carries it forward. Many times the founders are brilliant engineers, right? Yes, um, many times. Um, and that evolution to professional management can really change the trajectory is what I've seen. And frankly, it's a bit of what I do as well, right? Is get there, get them to the next stage. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so how often can you see a, a true founder step back from that role? And I've seen it a few times in my career, but not very many, and let that next sort of generation of leadership go and, and become an innovator again and stay in the business. Do you see that? Yeah, um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's rare in many cases. Um, you know, most of the founders transparently that we work with, that we end up bringing on as, as partners, um, have, are looking to exit their business on the other side of the exit, right? They're, you know, in many cases, uh, you know, 45 plus years old, they've built an awesome business and they're looking for their next adventure, whether that's building another business, investing in other startups, or really just spending more time with their family because they've neglected them for so long. Um, and so, so uh, you know, taking that out of the equation, which, you know, we work with a very exclusive group of people who meet that certain criteria, at a more general level of founders and founder-led businesses, I find all too often that founders have made themselves indispensable from the business, that They've made themselves and many times their, their team members key men in the business that ultimately ends the, end up getting the business discounted at exit or a five year, you know, whatever the lock in agreement is on the other side of the exit that they have to stay on board. Yeah. And that is one of the worst things you can do, not only if you're looking to exit the business, but also just to manage founder burnout, right? <laughs> And, and that is real. Like it's something we don't talk about, this whole concept of burnout. But it doesn't make us weak. It makes us human. And our personal, the, the, the way that we run our personal lives and our business are interconnected and, and as to our employees as well. And we impact them with every decision that we make. And if we're burnt out, whew, you are not leading the right way, whether that's at work or at home. Yeah. And as a guy who burned out building something for a PE firm once upon a time, Right. I tell a story. I think like a rock star, man, I could work 18 hours a day and I did it for 16 months straight, but there was very little left standing when I was done, including me. <laughs> right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I'm curious, did you get an executive coach or anything along those lines as, as you were kind of managing that? So I've actually, one of my business partners in my software business actually was my coach for probably a decade and a half. Um, and building sales organizations and teams. And I actually ended up going the traditional therapy route. So, right, and it was because I had gotten to the point as the burnout was, and you see this, and it was, we, you lived in tech, you live in M&A and all that stuff. I got to the point where some of it's not even real. So I read um, Stuart Friedman's books out of Wharton, right? He's the life work-life balance guy yeah. and I looked at that and I went to some people and they're like no you need a real therapist this is not just business because I had set everything aside to drive the number mm -hmm. so you know it was interesting because you go in there and you're like well what do you do well there's this but you in my case you didn't didn't trust senior leadership right um had challenges with key vendor relationships had contractual challenges with key suppliers and all that stuff. So I was operating from a place of total mistrust with everybody but my yoga instructors. So, yeah. Right? Wow. Um, yeah, and it really took about six months for me to kind of step back and get back into the right mindset. I mean, I, I run into that time and time again. In fact, myself, even, you know, even recently, especially with 2020 being such a tough year and, and so much introspection uh, necessary, right? Uh, you know, me, I, I felt like I kind of plateaued as a leader in 2020 uh, and was having trouble getting to the next level of my leadership competencies. And, and that was really when I started looking to the concept of an executive coach again, something that I had always kind of shunned, if you will, like, no, I don't, I don't need that. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but I went down a path, had dozens of conversations until I landed on a coach that was right for me, right? Sometimes it's a coach, sometimes it's a therapist, quite frankly. Yeah. And uh, 
ultimately I have not been more thankful by bringing on exec coach because working with them has just been transformational in, in both my professional and personal life, right? Everything from 360 reviews, seeing what people actually think about you <laughs> and, and where they're, they're safe zone to open up, whether that's family, friends, or, or, uh, or your, your work life. And man, I know I've got a long way to go on my personal growth still, but uh, I, I, uh, it's been, it's been transformational for me. So I just always like to talk to people about exec coaching and, and uh, helping manage burnout through having that person to lean on as well. Yeah. It, you know, in one of the things I talked to my friends and my peer group about is, I don't know about you, but I woke up one day and suddenly I was running businesses. And what you find is it's almost an echo chamber because my whole social circle was people at similar places, maybe different ages, but similar places in the career. They're running businesses, maybe even in the same industry, but certainly in adjunct industries. And that becomes your whole life. Yeah, you know, it does yeah. really quickly. <laughs> really, really quickly, right? And you're, you're on, you know, beyond investments. I know you're probably on a couple of boards too, right? And do some stuff. Next thing you know, you end up on this board and you're an advisor here and you're a non-listed advisor there. And it just, it's great. And you grow professionally, but suddenly you wake up one day and my friend, Mike O'Neill told me I retired and I had to come back to work because I realized all my friends worked. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, that's a, that's a great story. Definitely. Uh, definitely connect with that one as well. <laughs> yeah. So for you, if we can, how do you manage the balance between the two? Because if you've got multiple investments, multiple things you're operating, where do they fit? Yeah. Um, I mean, ultimately it, it really starts with having the right team in place. It always, it always does. Right. And there's a reason why if you look on any, you know, largest or most prevalent business challenges list, no matter the size of the company, it's always talent acquisition and, and retention. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's just, it's just the name of the game. It's, it's what it is. And it's the hardest thing, uh, for me and for everyone to do, we've got a lot of open requisite job requisitions because, you know, we can't uh, sacrifice uh, not having the right people in our business because we're such a, you know, focused and exclusive business and building a business of qualified, talented people, no matter what your business is that are going to treat your clients like you do is never easy. And even harder at, you know, at the earlier stages of a company where you've got literally everything working against you, right? <laughs> a million things to do. Hiring is time consuming. Uh, you might not have the cash that comparable job roles that larger companies do. But the cool thing is you ha always have something on your side, all right? Uh, the ability to let your most talented people grow within the business and take on responsibility, become CEOs of their own functional areas, if you will. And, and that's what we did. I mean, that's as much as possible, we've turned Orchid Black into a, a meritocracy from the top down. Um, you know, we have this performance-based model that we employ with our partner clients where we're not like traditional management consultants. We take, a, you know, our fees as largely upside or equity or percentage of sales, something aligning incentives with performance. And we do the same thing internally by offering, um, you know, a piece of our pie and a piece of you know the wins that we have with our with our employees, um, and we're all betting on ourselves to drive growth, and incentives are aligned, and like that's what building businesses is, is all about. Whether it's your clients' businesses or your own, is you give people the opportunity to shine. You you show them a path towards career growth, and um, you know it, you've got uh, you've got your employees serving your clients, who then ultimately serve you. And it's this, this beautiful circle when it worked perfectly. Yeah. And you talked about talent acquisition. And I think, you know, we hear it in the, in the news now. There's not enough people working in restaurants. There's not enough people working retail, right? People are having to cut hours. I don't think people have realized in small and even large companies how hard it is to find talent right now. Can you, wow. yeah. you know, share some stories about what you're seeing out in the market just overall? Yeah. I mean, it's... Um, it is a very tough market from my perspective. You know, we're, we're, um, we've got a, a focused, you know, initiative this year and, and ongoing um, that 
you know, around diversity and inclusion. Um, and um, one would think that that would, you know, make your ability to go seek out and find the right people <laughs> even easier because you've really got a, a focused strategy on talent acquisition. But in reality, you know, if you're finding the right people and the exclusiveness that you want to keep in your business, uh, just like we do, um, you're looking for people who are typically already at a job. So you're needing to not only offer them something better than th what their current job is offering, but also, you know, show them the path towards, you know, what that looks like from a future perspective, which is just, it's just tough. And if they don't know you, you don't get the, you don't get it through referral, right? You're you're doing cold reach outs or reach outs through recruiters, whatever it might be. You're, it's a it's a challenging landscape to be able to find talent, no matter what that seniority level is, um, and uh, especially challenging when you're really focused on improving the level of diversity and inclusion you offer as a business. <laughs> so um, I don't know. It's it's a uh, it's. I get passionate about these things because I'm spending a lot of my time <laughs> trying to find these folks. Um, and it's a mistake that all too many businesses make in hiring the wrong people just because they need to hire. So as long as it starts with a talent strategy, as long as, as, long as you don't sacrifice the, um, the level of talent that you're allowing within your firm, you can be you know, ultimately successful, but that really does impact the level of scale you're able to achieve. Yeah, it, it does. And, and the, there, there is, you know, talent is so tight out there at any price, right? And we talked about wow. before we hit record, right? I'm having a hard time hiring in Austin, Texas. I want to sign a bigger lease, take on office space, and I want to find a dozen salespeople. <laughs> Finding a dozen salespeople that will show up for work, do the job, and be motivated, and as you talked about, passionate for what you do, is really hard right now. It is. Yeah. Very. <laughs> My, my gal goal is to build that sales force and have it be geographically diverse as well. Yeah, that is incredibly difficult. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, product with tech companies. Where do you see them miss the boat most often? Whew, uh, that is, we could spend an entire session on that. <laughs> um, I'd say it's a couple things, um, and I'll classify them as product management and product marketing, which is connected to product-led growth. Um, and ultimately, there's this movement, this product-led growth movement or this PLG movement where, you know, it, it connects intimately to your customer acquisition funnel, and uh, it drives growth within the business via, you know, a, a true funnel, which, you know, a lot of people will tell you the funnel is dead. It's not dead. They're lying. It's time tested. It's true. And it's the backbone of every company. But what people don't get is it connects intimately to the product that you're offering and the manifesto that you have put in place that shows people not just that you've got a product, not that just that it has a use, but that there is a game changing in technology you know, companies anyway, a game changing mantra and a game-changing, um, almost like cult-like following, if you will, that is connected to it. So that's that's the product-led growth part. I'm happy to dive into that because that is a major passion of mine. But the second piece is just general product management, right? Building technology, especially when you're a technologist or you know a, a technology expert, mm -hmm. um, can often be done without documentation, Right, without strategy, without roadmap, because you believe that since it's your technology and what you've built and and some some great you know elements of you know incredible tech, um, whether that's something like emerging tech like AI or blockchain or even something just you know more more simple and standard, it's awesome. But it needs to be documented. It needs to eventually be driven by somebody else other than you as the founder. <laughs> And there needs to be best practices around product management and quality assurance and, and things that um, a lot of companies forget about as they're building. Um, and uh, that is something that is a big, um, uh, a, a big discount, if you will, on your value price at exit if you don't have in place. Um, so I would say that combination, product management and then product-led growth um as uh as kind of the two biggest areas of opportunity you know it's interesting so as you talk about that quality piece 
I've actually experienced a fair amount on the opposite end of that, where they're afraid to let something go because it's not just, it, it's this far away, right? And it does what it's supposed to do, but it's some intrinsic value that the founder has that it's, well, yeah, but it could be better. They're like, yeah. yeah, let's go sell it and nobody will complain if you improve it because it does what it's supposed to. <laughs> Yeah. And when I say quality assurance, I more mean like a real QA process okay. around people in your business actually doing it, not you. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, I, I totally agree. That is that is something that we as founders do try to do. We try to control everything and have our hands on everything because if we don't do it right, it's not going to be as good as as if, you know, it's, it, it's, it's just the way a lot of humans are wired to think. Yeah. But when you build the right people around you and you hire for people's strengths and you empower them to drive areas of the business, man, things are a lot smoother and you can grow a lot quicker. That's for, that is for sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I, I use the phrase, I'd never go to a barber for brain surgery. Right. <laughs> yes. They both, they both work with your head, but they have different specialties. Right. Yeah. And so many founders to your point, want to do it all or think they're the best ones to do it all. You know, and, and I watch them not go to lawyers when they should. I watch them not go to financial professionals when they should, right? And it's like, this isn't what you do. You, you do a lot of things, you do them great. You're not on Wall Street for a reason. So let's go to somebody who knows how to operate in that world. A hundred, yeah, man, you are speaking my language 100%, Tim. Yeah. I, uh, and, and we all run into that, right? We all, we all forget that when we're in the business, right? It's, it's not until we step back and, and we work on the business that we actually, you know, focus on that supplement, the supplementary like pieces, whether that's full-time hires or in many cases, outside experts. Yeah. Uh, y you need it. <laughs> Can't do it all yourself. It's, it's impossible. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, <laughs> I, I just had the vision of somebody I know that had to do all their own brochures in Adobe because they didn't trust anyone else with the layout. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that exact use case a couple times. <laughs> yeah. 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 But it's not as crisp as I would like it. Okay. But you are the founder and you lead product development and you lead sales. Can you, can you just hire an intern? A hundred, a hundred percent or, or, you know, the, the founder who actually is the lead salesperson, you know, staying the lead salesperson because they know that they can sell deals better than anyone else. And as everyone knows, you know, number one, that's not scalable. Number two, you can't have, your sellers shouldn't even be your prospectors, right? In right. order to actually have a real funnel on a, you know, more aggressive spearing strategy, if you will, through like a BDR or SDR and account executive type approach, you've got to separate roles. And the same as when you're a founder, you've got to separate roles in building the company. It's just the way you build. Yeah. You, you know, it's really, one of the things you hit it with the BDR, SDR, right? Um, people don't look at their sales cycles, right? They do think the same person that can open the door is the one that can close the deal and do the nuances. And you lose so many opportunities, not just early stage companies, but mature companies, because Absolutely. you're trying to get everyone to do everything. But I gave them a list, but I bought them the subscription. That's great. And the other thing they do is you take the person who's the good closer and you decide their metrics are, yeah, but now you have to find 200 new prospects. <laughs> So or, or, you're, or you're the right person to manage the sales team, right? What, oh, yeah. what, what, <laughs> that happens everywhere. Everywhere. Every, I've done it. I've made that mistake more been. than once, right? I mean, I've been that mistake. <laughs> <I've>, <laughs> exactly. But no, you hit, you hit the nail on the head for that one, right? On the, you know, that fatal mistake of assuming account executives or sellers should and will find new business on their own, right? They're compensated for higher value activities. Right? They're typically pretty terrible at prospecting. And yes. most worst of all, once they prospect and they generate pipeline, they become too busy to actually prospect effectively. <laughs> so it's, it's this uh, endless loop of, uh, of uh, failed expectations, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, the next thing they do is then they build a career path built on moving from the SDR role to the sales role to the management role. Right. Well, this is your career path. 
and they're no more equipped than if you just started them in the middle or somewhere else, right? Yeah, yeah, especially that management one, right? Yeah. Making your lead salesperson, your best salesperson, your sales manager is something that I think almost every organization does at one point in time. Yeah, it's it, it's a failure point for sure. Yeah, there was a video that went around and I forget the guy's name, but I saw it about six months ago on LinkedIn. It's like, oh, so I don't get more money, but I get a title, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh, I have more responsibility, but no extra money. Thanks, boss. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> or not great, but uh, definitely uh, rings wrong. a bell. <laughs> <laughs> so your own journey, how did you get into this business and where you are today? Yeah, so I mentioned that I got started with my family company or family business. Um, you know, I uh, post family business, which is which is probably the, the most important part. Um, I uh, spent a significant amount of time with working with technology companies, and um, whether it was as an investor or as an operator um, or even as a consultant, they all had the same the same problems. They all had went through the same challenges and. And ultimately, I uh, recognized that there just had to be a better way to help people navigate those challenges. Um, and so we started a business around it, and we aligned a performance model in line with incentivizing, you know, growth. And just like in any business, right? As you, if you align incentives uh, and you align performance, and you really hire the right people and select the right ideal client profile you can see magic happen and that's kind of that's kind of what we've that's kind of what we've seen is is magic happen um it's a slow growth it's a steady growth but it's uh we're seeing some really awesome things happen uh one of which you know a, a founder that we were working with um had built an incredible business up to about 23 million is what he was valued at in the marketplace um, and he really couldn't figure out how to grow further or ultimately increase his valuation. Um, he had tried everything that he knew, um, and he had a really sound business, but because he was no longer growing, uh, and he was investing in growth, his value was actually on the decline, right? Cause he was, you know, his margins were shrinking and his top line wasn't, wasn't growing. And and so ultimately, you know, he brought us in, we did, uh, we, we ran our process, which starts with a value creation assessment to identify all the levers for growth within the business. Uh, we provided a recommendation on, on how he could take the business from 23 million to actually 35 million in about 12 months, if he did some core things. And because we had done such a great job, he actually brought us on to uh, execute the plan with him. And based on bringing us on board, in doing all the right things at the right time, we actually were able to increase the value of the business from 23 to 36 million and exit in seven months rather than 12. Uh, ironically, it was the same buyer that ultimately was interested at the $23 million level originally. <laughs> um, and a lot of that was focusing on things like revenue concentration, pricing, um, you know, it, tangential uh, markets, op market opportunities that were untapped. Uh, leveraging partners uh, as part of the scaling process, which, um, you know, having the right partner program in place to, to augment your direct approach is, is incredibly important. And cleaning things up that the, that the company was being discounted on significantly, like financials, right? Like uh, product management, um, like a, a quality assurance process, things that, you know, are, are key towards scaling a business. And so I love stories like that because now we're doing two things. We're working with that founder on a new business. Uh, he's investing in other businesses and he got an extensively higher, right? A 55% increase in his exit value. That's allowing him to do things like spend more time with his family and, and actually leave a legacy for his family and, and ultimately, you know, do some really cool things that, um, are uh, what a lot of founders end up doing post-exit, building companies, building more companies and investing in more companies, which is pretty great. Yeah, it, it, it is an addictive sport, so to speak, right? <laughs> it is, yes. <laughs> Very addictive. So kind of bringing it all around and bringing it back home. You've talked about the size revenue-wise of companies. You've talked about in tech, tech's a pretty wide field. Is there an employee size or customer count size where your services start to make sense for somebody? Yeah. 
Yeah. So our, our ideal client profile is, is actually relatively simple. It's, it's uh, founders who've built a good company, but realize they need help taking it to the next level. They might be stuck in the day-to-day. Growth is likely stagnant or declining, and they're interested in an exit, whether that's an investment or, or a transaction, whether that's investment or a full exit within the next three years. Um, they're in their growth stage with revenue, typically between $3 million and $50 million in, in annual recurring revenue. And they're in the black or profitable um, and exhibit many elements of some product market fit, right? Some customer con- continuity, if you will, with their product. Um, and, and tech focused to us, 90% of our clients are software. Uh, the other 10% are you know, tech enabled services or hardware, things that are companies that are leveraging innovation to uh, you know, disrupt the marketplace, if you will. Um, and ultimately have a pretty strong competitive advantage. And then the final part is little to no institutional capital, meaning venture capital or private equity typically does not have an ownership in the business. Um, a few of the clients we work with are, but those, those VC or PE firms take more of a passive role. Now, we do, we do actually love working with private equity firms on the other side of a transaction, right, to, right. As, as where our exit goes. So there's nothing wrong with VCRP in terms of those models work for certain types of companies. That's just where our that's just where our niche is. Yeah, and it, the, you said it without saying it is there is a place for PE, right? And a Absolutely. lot of times it is that next step for a mature company. We've seen it with big public companies over the past several decades. It makes sense at every size level. It really does. Spot on. Spot on. So what haven't we talked about that we should have? <laughs> Um, I am terrible at not talking about my personal life and only focusing on business. And I wish more founders didn't do that. So what I would say is I have a loving fiance that might be the most patient woman in the world. (laughs) Over the last seven years, she's put up with more 3 a.m. nights than I care to count. (laughs) And weeks away, travel, unexpected cancellations, right? In summary, the dating or, you know, living with an entrepreneur and, Let's give these folks more credit, right? Her or all of our significant others in the world of entrepreneurialism, because uh, I've over the last year really started to reprioritize my personal time more than I ever have. I'm getting married next year, or actually, geez, yeah, next year, <laughs> next May. Um, and uh, my my personal roadmap is is becoming you know a, a high priority for me. And I am finally taking vacation, which we all should. Um, to uh, to really decompress and and uh, get our heads out of the business when uh, when we have a need to and spend some time with our families. Yeah, you know it's so hard to step away, and I think it's uh, it's not an only an American problem, but I think it's a uniquely American problem. Right? It is. Yeah, it absolutely is. Yeah, yeah, because I I'm the worst. I won't go offline or anything. Yeah, I totally understand that. And you're right. Our partners need. <laughs> way more credit because living with a founder living with an executive you know living with an innovator it is its own set of challenges no matter what your career is yeah yeah and, and our employees need more credit too right they run they drive that they drive the business and yeah. and in especially in these early stage companies they do a lot of things and wear a lot of hats and what we definitely don't want to do is encourage them to by never taking a break ourselves, never take a break because they, they're they not the founder, right? They deserve some time. They deserve even more time off than we do. And it's hard to realize what you might be doing and the impact you might be having on them, especially in a business like ours where people work really damn hard, right? We're not a nine to five business by any means, but we definitely want people to take vacation. And, um, you know, as I look for talent in the marketplace, one of the things I'm seeing pretty often is a lot of a lot of people are actually un- unhappy where they currently are. They're just making a pretty high compensation um, and uh, and are, are living with it, if you will. And that's just not a way to live. No, because it eventually leads to where I went, right? I had unlimited vacation and I took two days off. Right? <laughs> and, and, you know, I look at senior execs that I've known for the last 20 years, 25 years, male and female, divorce rate is brutal, right? The failed relationship over and over and over again train because we just keep doing the same thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> T- time away is key. <laughs> so, Jim, thanks so much for being here today. Um, 
A- any closing thoughts? It's been a pleasure, Tim. Um, if anyone uh, wants to reach out to me, whether it's at our website, orchid.black, or on LinkedIn at uh, Jim Barnish Jr., or you can also find me at Grow Smart, Grow Fast. Uh, I would love to use some of my office hours each week to see if I can help you and point you in the right direction, whether it's Tim, myself, or somebody else, and uh, ultimately see if uh, there's some value that can be added, because I love talking to founders. It's uh, why I get up in the morning. So. <laughs>